In times of trouble, God's people have often found themselves turning to the Psalms. They turn to the Psalms because the Psalms just speak to our hearts. The Psalms speak to our hearts in ways that comfort us when we're suffering. They renew us when we're broken. They lift us up when we're down and discouraged. And, and folks, the reason that the the Psalms minister like this is because, as someone has put it, the Psalms speak the universal language of the human soul. And that's so true. They, they speak to our hearts in ways that just connect with us. And the reason they speak like this is because the men who penned the Psalms were very transparent. They were very honest. They were not afraid to bear their souls and just honestly tell us what was going on in, inside of them. Their struggles, their joys, their, their triumphs, their defeats, their highs, their lows. They tell us that there were times they praised God, but they also tell us that there were times they were in despair. When God, it felt to them that he had abandoned them. And so, you see, we're drawn to the Psalms because we can easily relate to the men who wrote them as they open up to us about their their fears and struggles, as I said, all, all those things. And what we read in the Psalms, it just resonates with us. It connects with us. We say amen. We're there. We, we understand what they were feeling because their experiences are our experiences. And so, because the Psalms speak like this to our hearts in very personal ways, and they really, they run the gamut of emotions, we just love the Psalms, and thus the reason we find ourselves turning to them when we're in need and we are hurting. Therefore, because of the unusual days that we are living in right now, I want us to study a very special Psalm both this morning and tonight. I want us to study Psalm 27, the Psalm that I read to you just a few minutes ago. You see, not only is Psalm 27 one of the best known Psalms, but it's also one of the most comforting psalms. It's one of the most encouraging psalms. And it's comfort and, and encouraging. It comforts us. It encourages us because it gives us hope in overcoming a, a sin that we all struggle with, we're all familiar with, we all have trouble with, and that is the sin of fear, being afraid, being frightened. Every one of us knows what it's like to be fearful, sometimes to the point where our fears paralyze us. They they draw us into to panic. They terrorize us. Here's how one man explained how widespread our fears can be. He said our fears are directed in so many areas. Fear of the unknown, fear of calamity, fear of sickness, fear of disease and death, fear of people, fear of losing our jobs, fear of enemy attacks, fear of being misunderstood or rejected or criticized or forgotten or being mistreated. He said, what makes matters worse is that at times the very things we feared occur. Sometimes it's worse than we anticipated. He writes, I've known times when I felt virtually paralyzed with feelings of panic. As fear gets a firm grip on us, we become its victim. Now, add to all of these fears that we have under normal conditions... Add to that the fears that we are now experiencing, struggling because of these very weird days that we're living in, not knowing how long this virus will keep spreading and killing people, not knowing how long this social isolation and lockdown will last, not knowing what shape our finances will be in when the dust settles, and not knowing what the new normal will be down the road. You add all of these fears to the old fears, and you can see that fear and, security and insecurity are very real problems for us, and therefore we need very real biblical answers for these fears. And that's why Psalm 27 is so significant. It's just so meaningful, because in this psalm, David instructs us on how he personally overcame his fears, and he instructs us on how we can do this too. But he does this, I want you to know, in a most unusual and interesting way. Let me show you what I, what I mean. Notice 
how David begins this psalm, verses 1 through 3. He says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Now, what's so striking about these opening verses is just how bold David is. How, how fearless the man sounds as he declares how unafraid he is of anything and, and anyone. His confidence, he says, is in God. Therefore, he fears no Man. And the reason for this lack of fear on David's part is because God, he says, is his light, his salvation, and his defense. He even goes so far as to say that even if an entire army attacked him, he would still not fear, but he would remain unafraid and confident in the Lord. Now, at this point, some of you may be thinking, Steve, I thought you said that this psalm would be a comfort to me, it would be an encouragement to me, but these words that you've just read from David, they're not comforting, they're not encouraging at all, because unlike David, I have real fears. And though I know Christ as my Lord, as my Savior, I still struggle with trusting him with my threatening circumstances. You may be thinking, I just can't relate to David. And what he wrote here about being fearless in the face of, of danger, that's not where I'm, I'm at. He must be more godly than me, He's certainly more spiritual than me, more mature in me. I'm just not there. That's how you feel. Then I do have some very good news for you. I have some very encouraging words for you. You and David are really not that very different at all. Because in spite of his strong statements here about being fearless and, and trusting the Lord, David still struggled at times with fear, just like you struggle, just like I struggle, just like all of us struggle. And I say that because if you look down a few verses... In this psalm, you'll see that David changes his tune as he tells us that he grappled with being fearful. Notice verses 7 through 9. He says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servants away in anger. You've been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Now, Look at these words. Instead of hearing David assert how unafraid he is, we hear David now crying out to God to deliver him from his enemies. And, and in doing so, he sounds very much afraid. He is afraid. Instead of hearing him assert how fearless he was, we now hear David sounding very anxious, very nervous as he tells us that he not only seeks God's ear, in prayer, he also seeks his face too, meaning his smile of approval. And he does this, he says, because he's afraid that God may be hiding his face from him and turning away from him in anger. And so he prays, do not abandon me. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. And for David, being abandoned by God would mean that his worst fears had materialized, that of being violently attacked and killed by his enemies. That's why he says, notice in verse 12, do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and such as breathe out violence. So what are we to make, folks, of these two completely opposite attitudes, these contrasting mood swings that David expresses here in Psalm 27? On the one hand, we hear him boldly boldly exclaiming a fearless confidence in the Lord to deliver him. And on the other hand, though, we find him sounding very much afraid of being overcome by violent men who are out to, to take his life. Well, some scholars have looked at these two opposite attitudes of fearlessness and fear, and they've concluded that either this psalm was written by two different authors, or if it was one off author then it must have been written by him at two different times in his life and under two different set of circumstances. And their argument, those who hold to this, their argument in, this, in holding to this view is that no one, they believe, could switch so quickly from faith and confidence in God to such 
fearfulness. Therefore, their conclusion, those who hold to this view, is that it just had to be written by two different men or by one man under two set of circumstances. But I want you to know that those who think this way are mistaken. And they miss the point of the psalm. They miss the purpose of David in telling us about his two distinct moods. See, what we have here in Psalm 27 is David presenting a very realistic picture of what it's like to, to be a believer dealing with dangerous situations and trials and problems and with all the fluctuating moods and various frames of mind that accompany these issues. By having these contrasting attitudes of no fear and then being fearful, David is simply and very honestly telling us that there are times in his life when his trust in the Lord is strong, absolute confidence in, in God's ability to protect him, and says, I'm not afraid at all. I'm bold. Old, I'm courageous, I'm trusting, there's no fear in me. But then he honestly switches gears and admits that there are other times when he, feel, he feels quite vulnerable and his confidence in the Lord is quite low and he struggles and he's tempted to be afraid, afraid that he won't be rescued by God from his enemies. Here's the way James Montgomery Boyce, I think, very wonderfully described David's fluctuating feelings. He wrote, what we have here is an unfolding of two closely related moods by the same inspired author, put together like two movements of a symphony. And the point is that these two, these two apparently opposing moods are also often in us, frequently at the same time, or at nearly the same time, he writes, don't you find that you're often both confident and anxious, trusting and fearful, or at least that your mood swings easily from one to the other? I do, he says. It's part of what it means to be a weak human being. It's a great statement from James Montgomery Boyce. So in light of the truth, and I want you to listen very closely here, because this is important, in light of, of, of this truth, I want you to know that far from being a psalm that we just can't relate to because of David's supposed superiority in terms of spiritual, his spiritual walk, his godliness, on the contrary, Psalm 27 is actually a psalm that we can very much relate to. It's for us. We're there. Because like David, we know what it's like to have victory over our fears sometimes. And we know what it's like to be anxious and fearful at other times. It's just like David. That's just the way he is. Or as someone so aptly put it, faith and fear very often fight each other for mastery of the soul. Isn't that true? Isn't that your experience? It certainly is my experience. There are times when my faith in the Lord seems to, to soar and nothing bothers me. I feel bold. I feel courageous, like I could take on anything, confident that the Lord will protect me. Absolutely no fear. But then there are other times when I feel just so very vulnerable and easily worried and fearful about all kinds of potential dangers and, and problems. That's just part of being a normal human being. It's also part of being a believer in Christ. It's the experience of every Christian. Sometimes we're bold and fearless, and other times we're just faint-hearted and fearful. But we must not, we cannot be content when we are fearful at any time. Why? Because it's wrong to be fearful. It's unacceptable. It's sinful. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That is a command of our Lord. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. It is a sin to be fearful. The Apostle Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is not from the Lord. So then, what we need to learn is how to trust the Lord during those times when we are just feeling very vulnerable to being afraid. In other words, we need to learn what to do when we're tempted to be frightened, when we struggle uh, and we're on the verge of caving into our fears. We need to learn what to do. And that's why Psalm 27 is so helpful. It's so comforting. It's so encouraging. 
because it offers us hope. You see, David didn't write this psalm to simply inform us that he had mood swings. This is, this is not therapy for David. This is not going to a counselor and opening his heart and just saying it makes me feel good to talk about myself. Not at all. No, David didn't write this psalm to inform us that he had mood swings between trust and fear. He had a definite purpose, a definite goal in telling us about his victory over fear and his struggle with fear. And his purpose was to teach us those who he knew would be reading this psalm. He's teaching us, he's instructing us on how to deal with our own fears, how to be confident in the Lord during the most severe and difficult trials in our lives. See, what David has done for us here in Psalm 27 is reveal how he had victory over his fears so that we can have victory over our fears. Far from being a psalm that we can't possibly identify with, Psalm 27 is a divinely inspired song of hope designed by God to teach us how to be fearless, how to trust the Lord, how to be trusting believers in Jesus Christ rather than people who succumb to our fears trembling with cowardice. Therefore, when we're finished studying this psalm, not only this morning, but we'll finish, and I hope you'll join us tonight. You should be able to say with David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? And the answer ought to rise up in your heart. Fear no one and nothing. That should be your experience. And so as we approach the actual text of Psalm 27, we find that in teaching us this great lesson on overcoming our fears, David has structured his words to form two main sections. First, he tells us about his lack of fear. His lack of fear. Then he tells us about his struggle with fear. This morning, we're going to look at David's lack of fear. We begin by looking at verse 1. He writes, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Now, as you can see, David begins his psalm by asking two very similar questions, whose answers are really quite obvious so that they don't even require a response. First, he asks, whom shall I fear? And his second question is, whom shall I dread? And to both of these questions, the answer, though not recorded here, is understood to be the same. No one. No one. There's no one and there's nothing, David says, that he fears or dreads. And the reason given by David as to why he doesn't fear or dread anyone or anything is because his relationship with the Lord is so close that God has become three things to him. His light, his salvation, his defense. Now, it's interesting that David doesn't say that God gave him these three things, light, salvation, and defense. He says that God is all of these to him, indicating that David's relationship with the Lord was so very personal, so very intimate, so very first hand in terms of his experience. As far as David is concerned, the Lord is his closest companion, whose very presence dispels all fears. So then the question we have to ask is, in what sense does David mean that the Lord is his light, his salvation, and his defense? Because whatever the Lord was to David, he can be and should be to us. First of all, then, let's consider what he means when he says, the Lord is my light. In the Bible, light is often referred to and used as a metaphor for a, a number of things, such as purity and holiness but it is primarily used in scripture to speak of dispelling the darkness of, of error and sinful behavior. In other words, light speaks of truth, of understanding, of illumination. And that's why we read in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is referred to as the light who's come into this world because he dispels the darkness about what God is like. And so we read, for example, in John chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, Speaking of Christ, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. 
There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So Jesus Christ is the light. And he's the light of men, John tells us, because in seeing him, we see what the Father is like. Because like the Father, Jesus Christ is God. He is the second member of the Trinity, the triune Godhead. In other words, Jesus dispels men's ignorance about God. That's why, folks, he could say to his, to his apostles, he who has seen me has seen the Father. But in David's case, here in Psalm 27, it does not appear that he's using the term light in the sense of truth or enlightenment about God. You see, David is writing in the context of potentially being attacked by his adversaries, his enemies. So he is most likely then thinking of God being his light. Watch this, in the sense that he dispels darkness by guiding him, guiding him, directing him. That is to say, the reason David has no fear is because he's confident that God will guide him to victory over his enemies. The same thing holds true for the other things he mentions that God is to him, his salvation and his defense. By salvation, he means that God is the one who who saves him, the one who rescues him from physical harm. That's what's on David's mind. And by defense of his life, he means a place of safety because the Hebrew word that David uses here means a strong fortified place, a a stronghold, a refuge, a place of, of refuge so that God is the one who defends and protects him from his enemies' attacks. That's what's on his mind. That's what he's talking about. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I realize that each of these words, light, salvation, and defense, as David is using them, may seem a bit inappropriate for us because he is using them in a military sense and that's just far removed from our daily battles with fear I get it I understand that however what God was to David on the battlefield he can be to you in your daily life and therefore the same kind of fearlessness that David had for his military enemies can be yours for anything that you feel threatened by That's the principle. That's the point. Note this, though. The only way you can have the same fearless attitude that King David had is if you see the Lord the same way that King David saw him as your light, your salvation, your strong tower of protection. So let me help you to think biblically about the Lord being these things to you. First of all, it is a fact that if you are a born-again believer... In Jesus Christ, and that really is the only kind of believer in Jesus Christ, born again. You're either born again or not. But if you know Christ is your Savior, then the Lord is your light. He's your light because he does guide you. Whether you recognize his guidance and direction in your life or not, he does guide you. The Bible teaches that all of our steps are sovereignly ordained, decreed by God. We read, for example, in Psalm 37, verses 23 through 25, The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I've been young, and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Commenting on these verses, Charles Spurgeon said, He's very precious and encouraging words concerning God's sovereign guiding of a believer's life. Spurgeon said, all his course of life is graciously ordained, and in loving kindness all is fixed, settled, and maintained. No reckless fate, no fickle chance rules us. Our every step is the subject of divine decree. See, what David is telling us in these verses here in Psalm 37 is that because the sovereign Lord is guiding you, your daily steps are ordered by him. Therefore, you don't need ever to be afraid of walking into any dark and terrible circumstances like the coronavirus or anything related to the coronavirus. Because no matter where he leads you, you can rest in the fact that this is where he has sovereignly decreed for you to be and that he, 
And here's the precious truth. He will always be with you. He will always be with you. He says that even in our sorrows and our trials, the Lord will hold your hand. Notice that. Look at verse 24 again. The Lord will hold your hand. Is that not a precious thought and imagery of God taking hold of our, of our hands? And he's not letting go of it. He'll continue to hold your hand, David says, your entire life. David said, I've been young, I'm old, and the Lord has never forsaken me. He's talking about even in your old age, the Lord's holding on to your hand. He'll never forsake you as you go through the various stages of life. He'll continue to guide you. He'll continue to sustain you all the while holding your hand even as you walk through those very dark valleys of life. How precious. Listen, with God promising to guide you, hold your hand, sustain you your entire life, you don't ever, ever need to be afraid of getting an illness or a life-threatening disease because he'll be right there with you, guiding you every step of the way. And when he sees fit, he will guide you right into heaven, still holding your hand. You don't need to be afraid of losing your job, losing your source of income, because the Lord, who's still on the throne of, of the universe, has told us that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, so that we can trust him to provide for our every need. See, folks, the reason those who know Christ should never fear anyone or anything is because in knowing the Lord, we have him as our light. And not only, as precious as that is, his daily guidance, it goes beyond that. He has enlightened us so that we know the truth about him. Not simply that he guides us, how wonderful that is, but that we know about him, that he has sovereignly ordained our circumstances, but it's more than that. We know that this one who has sovereignly ordained our circumstances is good. He is wise. He is kind. He is merciful. He is loving and he never changes. And so we know that even when our circumstances are just horrible, he'll be there for us, comforting us, giving us grace to endure. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 through the Apostle Paul, who referred to God the Father as the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And that's exactly who he is. So why should we fear? Why should we fear? But he's not only our light. David says he's also our salvation, just as he was his salvation. And not only because he has saved us from eternal punishment for our sins through Christ's atonement, and that is the most precious truth in the universe, but also because... Our Lord saves us from being overwhelmed in situations that are, we feel are just too much for us. He's there delivering us, rescuing us, saving us. See, the Bible says that God will never let you be tempted above the strength that he gives you to handle it. You'll never be put in a situation where, where you can say, I can't do this because God's grace is always sufficient. This is the way he delivers us, by giving us his strength and never putting us in a situation that we can't handle. That's why 1 Corinthians 10, 13 has this precious promise. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you'll be able to endure it. And just as he's our light and our salvation, the Lord is also the defense of our lives in that he is our refuge, he's our stronghold. In other words, he's the one we run to when we're in trouble, and he's the one who when we run to him, his arms are open, he takes us in, he protects us, he keeps us safe. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous runs into it and is safe. Listen, We can trust the Lord to protect us so that nothing happens to us outside of his sovereign will. And whatever negative things might happen to us in God's sovereign will, we know that we can trust him to use it for our good. Because that's what Romans 8.28 said. Joel reminded us of that a few minutes ago. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. And then Paul goes on in verse 27 to explain what his ultimate purpose is. 
His calling for us, according to verse 29, is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So everything in life, the good, the bad, the neutral, all of it is under God's sovereign control to make us more Christ-like in terms of character, maturity, Christ-likeness in our character. So David says that because God is his light, salvation, his refuge, there is no one that he's afraid of. But before we leave verse 1, there's something else I want you to see, something that's important. Notice the last of the two questions that David asks. He says, whom shall I dread? Now, what's interesting about this question is that this particular Hebrew word that is translated dread means to be in awe of someone, but not in a positive way. This is not like saying, oh, that's awesome. I'm in awe of that. No, no, this is in a very negative way so that one is fearful to the point of trembling, shaking, because they're they're just terrified. So what David is telling us is that the Lord means so much to him with such a tower of, of light and salvation and refuge to him that he was in awe of no one and nothing. He didn't tremble. He didn't shake. He wasn't nervous about anyone or anything. Did you get that? that this, is, this is a significant truth. David says that he was so enamored and so impressed with the Lord that he did not dread anyone and therefore he didn't tremble at the thought of anyone doing anything harmful to him. Now folks, this is the way that we want to be. And it's not something that's beyond us because this is the way that David was. And he was a believer just like we're believers. He wasn't fearful of anything because he saw God as awesome and almighty. But listen, this victory over his fears, it didn't come naturally to David. It didn't happen overnight. He didn't wake up one day and all of a sudden this came together. He actually had to learn to be fearless just as you and I have to learn the same thing. So how can we learn this? How can we become fearless like David was? How did David learn to be unafraid of anyone and anything? That is to say, how did he come to a point in his life where he saw God as his light, as his salvation, as his defense? How did he come to that place where he saw God as awesome and almighty so that he dreaded no one? Well, he tells us. He tells us how in the next few verses, verses 2 and 3. He says, when evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Now, first of all, what we see here is that David, what he's doing is he's taking us back in time to some past experience. He's not giving us the details of that, but he's not talking about the present. He's talking about the past, when evildoers came upon him to devour his flesh, meaning they they came upon him to try to kill him. He's telling us in the past, God then intervened. God protected him so that these evildoers stumbled and they fell. They weren't successful in their attack upon him. Therefore, He says in verse 3 that as a result of this protection that he received from the Lord sometime in the past, he was emboldened, he was strengthened so that now, even, even if an entire host of warriors encamped against him or a war broke out against him, he says that he would not be afraid, nor would he lose his confidence in God. Now, this is a tremendous principle. See, what David is telling us here is that based on how he has seen God work in his life in prior days, delivering him from all kinds of life-threatening situations, he knows that he doesn't have to be afraid of what might happen to him in the future because he knows that he can trust, he can trust God to protect him. In other words, the reason he has no fear of anyone or anything is because he has already seen God work mightily in his life. He's seen it already, and therefore he knows that he can trust God to work mightily in his life again in the future, whatever happens. Listen closely. This is so important because the way that David came to this point of overcoming all of his fears... That's the same way that you and I can gain victory over our fears. 
It comes by thinking back to those times in your life when you thought you were in an impossible situation. Humanly, it was impossible. But in looking back, you realize, but God delivered me. God rescued me. He brought me through that very dark and very difficult time in my life. If you do that, you will find your confidence in the Lord rising. You will find your fears diminishing because the one who guided you, the one who rescued you, the one who protected you in former days, listen, he's the same one you can trust to guide and rescue you and protect you in any day of trouble. So I exhort each of you to, to make a conscious effort to think back to some very rough days or day in your life and recall just how the Lord brought you through that time. This is why I recommend writing in a journal or a, a diary so that the next time you face a menacing situation that looks absolutely impossible, you can turn to your journal your diary, and remind yourself, oh yeah, I, I had forgotten, but that's how the Lord delivered me in the past. I know that when I've looked back at things I've written in a journal, I, I realize I forgot how difficult those times were. But God delivered me when I didn't realize how I could possibly come through that difficult time. He did it, and he'll do it again. However, thinking back to some past experience while that's important, it's only part of what helped David to become fearless. There's something else that enabled this man to learn to trust the Lord and to eliminate his fears. Notice what he tells us in verse 4. He says, One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. With this statement, David reveals the source of his great faith in God and why he was able to overcome all of his fears. He tells us that his one great desire in life, his single-minded quest, and something that he has been asking God for and he will continue to seek the Lord about is that he would dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of his life in order to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Now, this sounds very similar to Psalm 23, does it not? Where David closes that psalm by saying, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But that statement, Psalm 23, that has to do with dwelling in God's house in heaven. This statement here in Psalm 27, when David speaks of dwelling in God's house all the days of his life, he's referring to God's earthly dwelling, not, not heaven. He means the tabernacle, which was Prior to the temple being built, it was that portable tent where God's presence dwelt in the nation of Israel. It moved around from place to place. And David, this is, not, this is not conjecture on our part. David makes this very clear by the way he describes God's house in the verses that follow. Notice verses 5 through 6. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he'll hide me. He'll lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer in his ten sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. So why was David then so obsessed with desiring to dwell in the tabernacle? I mean, why did he want to spend so much time there, as much time as possible? It wasn't because David was enamored with the physical beauty or aspect of the tabernacle. After all, folks, it was just a, it was just a tent wasn't a magnificent temple, it's just a tent. You see, what drove David to want to spend so much time in that tent was that it was here that he was able to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to meditate about him. Remember, inside the tent was the very presence of God. God said his Shekinah glory would, would dwell there. It was revealed in a cloud. So to spend time in that tent... For David, it was to spend time gazing upon the beauty of the Lord, meditating on him and his wonderful works. So don't miss the point of what David is saying. What he's telling us is that the reason he no longer feared anyone or anything is because he spent time in fellowship with the Lord. You see, by gazing upon the Lord, 
and meditating on his word, David grew bold in his faith because he was able to see just how great and majestic and powerful and wise and good God really is. And when he did that, he said all of his adversaries, all of his enemies, all of his problems looked very small and powerless in comparison. That's why he says in verses 5 and 6 that when the, the day of trouble comes, he's confident that God will conceal him and hide him and lift him up on a rock and that he'll sing praises to the Lord. In other words, he's saying as a result of fellowshipping with the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, he is sure that God will protect him. So he is unafraid of what might happen in the future. You see, folks, if you want to have victory over fear, any fear, then you must spend time with the Lord. You must. You must open his word. You must spend time reading it. You must spend time praying to him. You must spend time closely looking at Christ on the pages of scripture, meditating on God's character, thinking about it, contemplating it, pondering these truths about him. And the more you know of him, of God, and his glory, the greater will be your faith in him. And the greater your faith, the more you will be unmoved by adversity. Because everything, as I said, looks small by comparison to God. In Luke chapter 8, we read about the time that the Lord's apostles were very fearful. They panicked when a storm came up upon them while they were on the Sea of Galilee, afraid that they were going to die after waking Jesus up from being asleep and saying to him, Master, Master, we're perishing. Luke tells us that the Lord said to them, Where is your faith? So, what a great question. Where was their faith? They certainly had faith in him. They were believers. God gives faith to believers. They had faith. They were his followers. They believed in him. So, where was their faith? Well, in the same place ours is when we fail to apply it to life's difficult moments. It's in our hearts, but it's not being put into operation at the moment. In his book entitled Spiritual Depression, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones comments on this incident on the Sea of Galilee and how his faith, our faith, needs to be applied to overcoming fear. I want to quote what Dr. Lloyd-Jones said. I don't usually do long quotes. I try not to do anything that's too lengthy. This is a lengthy quote, but it's well worth listening to. It's profound it's deep, it's life-changing, it has impacted me tremendously, and I want to share it with you. So bear with me as I read to you from Martin Lloyd-Jones. He writes, what is faith? Let us look at it positively. The principle taught here is that faith is an activity. It's something that has to be exercised. It does not come into operation itself. You and I have to put it into operation. It is a form of activity. Let me divide this up a little. Faith is something you and I have to bring into operation. That's exactly what our Lord said to these men. He said, where is your faith? Which means, why are you not taking your faith and applying it to this position? You see, it was because they did not do so, because they did not put their faith into operation, that the disciples became unhappy and were in this state of consternation. How then does one put faith into operation? What do I mean by saying that faith is something we have to apply? I can divide my answer in this way. The first thing I must do when I find myself in a difficult position is to refuse to allow myself to be controlled by that situation. A negative, you see. These men were in the boat. The master was asleep and the billows were rolling. The water was coming in and they could not bail it out fast enough. It looked as if they were going to sink, and their trouble was that they were controlled by that situation. They should have applied their faith and taken charge of it and said, no, we're not going to panic. They should have started it that, in that way, but they did not do so. They allowed the position to control them. Faith is a refusal to panic. Do you like that sort of definition of faith? Does that seem to be too earthly and not sufficiently spiritual? It's the very essence of faith. Faith is a refusal to panic, come what may. 
That's what these men did not do. They allowed this situation to grip them. They became panicky. Faith, however, is a refusal to allow that. It says, I'm, I'm not going to be controlled by these circumstances. I'm in control. So you take charge of yourself and pull yourself up. You control yourself. You do not let yourself go. You assert yourself. That's the first thing, but it does not stop at that. That's not enough because that may be nothing but resignation. That's not the whole of faith. Having taken that first step, having pulled yourself up, and you, and you then remind yourself of what you believe and what you know. That, again, is something these foolish disciples did not do. If only they had stopped a moment and said, now then, what about this? It, it, it's possible that we're going to drown with him in the boat? Is there anything he cannot do? We've seen his miracles. He turned the water into wine. He can heal the blind and the lame. He can even raise the dead. It, it, is it likely that he's going to allow us and himself to be drowned in this way? Impossible. In any case, he loves us. He cares for us. He's told us that the very hairs of our head are all numbered. That is the way in which faith reasons. It says, all right, I see the waves and the billows, but it always puts in this but. That's faith. It holds on to truth and reasons from what it knows to be fact. That's the way to apply faith. These men did not do that, and that's why they became agitated and panic-stricken. And you and I will become panic-stricken and agitated if we fail to do the same. Whatever the circumstances, therefore, stand. Wait for a moment <clears throat> and say, I admit it all. But, but what? But God, but the Lord Jesus Christ. But what? The whole of my salvation. That is what faith does. All things may seem to be against me, to drive me to despair. I do not understand what's happening, but I know this. I know that God has so loved me that he has sent his only begotten son into this world for me. I know that while I was an enemy, God sent his only son to die on the cross on Calvary's hill for me. He has done that for me while I was an enemy, a rebellious alien. I know that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I know that at the cost of his, own, uh, of his life's blood, I have salvation and that I am a child of God and an heir to everlasting bliss. I know that very well then. I know that, uh, I know this, that if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, Romans 5.10. It's inevitable logic, and faith argues like that. Faith reminds itself of what the scripture calls the exceeding, exceeding great and precious promises. Faith says, I cannot believe that he who has brought me so far is going to let me down at this point. It is impossible. It would be inconsistent with the character of God. So faith, having refused to be controlled by circumstances, reminds itself of what it believes and what it knows. End of quote. Now, folks, we need to do what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones has advised us to do. Apply your faith by reminding yourself of what you believe and what you do know about the Lord. But in order to believe and know about him, you have to spend time with him. You have to gaze at him on the pages of scripture. You have to think about his attributes as revealed in the word of God. You must have David's passion and desire to spend time in fellowship with Christ and his word, looking at his beauty, meditating on what you see. These days are a perfect time to do that. We're not doing much else. We're, we're shut in our homes. Other than essentials, we have no place to go. So use this time to wisely read the word of God. Meditate on what you're learning about. Think about these things. And when you do that, you'll be able to overcome any fear. Have a fresh vision of how immense God is. And by comparison, how really small your problems are. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, one who has trusted Christ for salvation, then I urge you to receive King David's instruction, his inspired instruction on how to be fearless. Think back to a time when God delivered you in the past, when it was just an impossible situation from your perspective, but he delivered you. 
And then believe that he who did it then is, can do it again at any time, no matter what you might face in the future or what you're facing right now. Make sure you're spending time alone with him, observing him, studying him, gazing upon him, meditating on him, because when you, when you see him and apply what you know about him, you'll vanquish all your, your fears. That's the point that Jesus was saying to the apostles. Where is your faith? Now, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have never repented, which means forsaken your sin, and turned to Christ and trusted him as your Lord and Savior, then you should be afraid. You should be afraid, not only of the things that may befall you in this, in this life, and especially at this time, but you should be afraid of what will happen to you in the next life, after you die. The Bible speaks of judgment after death. Scripture says it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment, meaning that you will stand before God, God who is perfect, God who is holy, God who is righteous, and you'll have to give an account to him of your life, which means that all of your sins will be laid out before you. And then, because you are a sinner like all of us, he will punish you accordingly, and that for all of eternity. How tragic, how sad, but that's not necessary. And that's the good news. It's not necessary that you be judged for your sin. You can be del delivered. You can be rescued. You can be saved from God's judgment if you will only turn to Jesus Christ and trust him that on the cross he was judged in your place. If you believe that, place your trust in Christ. Turn from your sin of self-sufficiency and self-centeredness and turn to Christ and his death as the sole basis for your salvation. There is nothing else. There is no other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved but Jesus Christ. There is no other sin bearer. There is no other atonement. There is no other substitute for sinners like us but Christ. I urge you, trust Christ today before it's too late. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice today, harden not your heart. Now is the time to repent and trust Christ. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray for you if you don't know Christ, to come to know him, and then Joel's going to come and close us in a song. Father, we thank you that this magnificent psalm does speak to our hearts. Lord, we relate to it. We understand where David's coming from. And Lord, I pray that we will take to heart these truths that have instructed us, that you've instructed us through your servant David on how to overcome our fears. These are fearful days, Lord. Men's hearts are failing them. Most people have nothing to cling to, no hope, but we have hope. We have Christ. We know who you are, Lord. We know you're sovereign. We know that this pestilence has come by your sovereign decree. We don't understand all the purposes for this, and we don't have to understand we just have to trust. So I pray that you'll help every believer to take to heart these truths and to trust you. And I pray for those who are watching that they will see that it is a frightening time and they have no hope except Christ. I pray that you'll draw them to yourself. I pray that you'll work a work of repentance and faith in them, that they will turn from their unbelief, their self-centeredness, and they will turn to Christ, seeing him who knew no sin dying on behalf of sinners. And may they place their trust, their confidence in Christ and follow him. Only you can do that work in their hearts. We ask you to do this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.